Imagine, a podcast series by Imagine Theatre. Hello again, how are you? Welcome to episode 51 of this podcast series. And this time we're here on campus at Staffordshire University in Stoke-on-Trent. For more information, go to their website at www.imaginetheatre.co.uk. I hope you enjoyed the last star-studded episode from the Trafalgar Theatre in the West End, where we went behind the scenes at the 2023 UK Pantomime Association Awards. You can catch up with that and any of the other previous episodes. Just go to where you normally get your podcasts from and make sure you subscribe so that you don't miss out in the future. This time we're here to meet the students studying on the very first master's level qualification that offers research and practical study in contemporary pantomime practice as they come to the middle of their very first academic year. The course was developed in association with Wilkes Academy and is supported by the UK's leading pantomime producers. The emphasis is vocational, allowing for formal industry training and careers networking as well through placements and work experience. Today, Imagine's Business and Marketing Director Sarah Bowden is here to talk to the students about the financial side of pantomime production. And we'll also catch up with the course leader Richard Cheshire in a moment's time. But first, Dr Robert Marsden, who's the head of the department here for media and performance. So Rob, before we talk to the students, just give us a background to the course and how it came about. Absolutely. Hi Martin, and thanks for welcoming me back into the podcast family. Staffordshire University is a vocationally led institution. It's rooted here in Stoke-on-Trent. Its roots are in pottery and, and mining and supporting all of that. That idea of that vocationally led set of courses has never gone away from, from 1911. In the Department of Media Performance and Communication, we've got uh, master's provision in film and theatre and music, um, as well as in animation. And it's unusual to have two academics and practitioners in a university who both understand pantomime. And myself and my colleague Richard Cheshire were both looking at industry needs and conversations that we've had over many years and thought that a programme in pantomime would be very, very beneficial mm -hmm. for, for the knock-on effects into industry and just as a fascinating subject in its own right to study. Um, because if you're going to study, say, for example, an MA in philosophy that we've got in the department, it doesn't mean we suddenly have 10 philosophers. <laughs> it's the joy of studying something at that level. And I know that you're going to be talking to the students a little bit later on, Martin. They've got very different aspirations. So the course was that developed out of a passion from the academic side we had that in-house expertise. We'd also got our MA in theatre and we thought that we could collaborate with the MA theatre students as well and I know that my colleague will be talking in a little bit um, of depth around, around the modules and the course content. Um, but it absolutely fitted into this idea. Uh, one of our university uh, strap lines is this around our next generation education. How do we support the next generation of students as well as informing industry and informing the field? Now, the field of pantomime, so much has been written about pantomime over the years, particularly from historical perspectives. Mm -hmm. But we wanted to move that forward and stand on those shoulders and really start to concentrate on contemporary manifestations of pantomime. So that idea of the next generation of pantomime makers, academics and thinkers who can take the field forward, both in terms of, as I say, practice and academic study and thinking, was really important for us as an institution and we're developing next generation ways of working, lots of authentic assessment, lots of real world projects. Sarah Bowden's in today working with the students and we've had a lot of the pantomime producers, as you know, uh, coming in and working with the students on the course. So that idea of a next generation approach, we're not just ourselves teaching the students. We've got all sorts of people coming in to support the students. So that idea of next generation experience as mm. well. So um, a, a few years back, we decided to put this idea of forward to uh, the school and wider faculty. It was generously looked at and approved. Uh, the industry support um, was, was tremendous when we did a lot of the market research at the time. And we move forward, and it's a unique offer at Staffordshire. Our, our MA programmes, we, we're very much encouraged to think about what's our unique approach built on staff expertise. A lot of history of theatre 
in Staffordshire and Stoke mm. on Trent with the with the new Vic, and we've obviously got um, the Regent Theatre part of um, part of the Ambassadors Group in the city. Um, so there's a lot of heritage in both the city itself and Staffordshire itself in terms of theatre, theatre making, and pantomime traditions as well. So we're able to really build out of that. Richard, we mentioned the course, but it's a vast area, and a lot of people underestimate what panto is. How do you fit all of that into a one-year course? Well, we wanted to start with the here and now. We wanted our students and ourselves really to survey the landscape of contemporary pantomime practice. And I think it's fair to say that they have been really surprised at the diversity that there is out there, the different ways in which uh, the different ethos and ideas that the producers, producing companies have, their priorities, what they want you know, the audience experience to be. So we've been looking at a vast variety of different forms of pantomime in both the commercial field, the subsidized repertory field, and in the community in the amateur field. So the students trace history backwards. So we might take, uh, for example, we might take a a storyline like Aladdin. We will then go back into history and look at examples, you know, in the uh, Regency period, the Victorian period, of Aladdin scripts, and they will explore those scripts on their feet. And they got very, they've got very shocked by the lack of the female voice this really this really bothered them and bugged them and then they will then come on to look to read current scripts see the pantomime in action in uh, all across the UK this year review that reflect upon that and then they presented research projects in areas of their expertise and that's the first module which is kind of looking at concepts manifestations of pantomime and ideas and principles and then they move on to the practice where they then explore on the rehearsal room floor in workshops reinvent it taking we're trying to get pantomime out of the shackles of the, the Victorian period you know and looking at how looking at slapstick routine and the idea of slapstick or slosh or the the comedy or the the idea and and trying to reinvent it for a contemporary uh, inclusive you know audience really mm-hmm. and for an audience that truly reflects britain and they will also do some writing of scripts if they're interested in, two of them are interested in performing. So they will, you know, rework and reinvent sort of the dame's opening spot or whatever, or question whether we need a dame's opening spot at all and how that can be integrated into the action. So they're, they're constantly appraising their practice in uh, the light of their understanding and the context of history, but also what is happening out there. And there's some really, I've been surprised at the the number of different exciting forms. We can no longer talk about pantomime and say, pantomime is X. Mm -hmm. It isn't, Mm -hmm. it's so varied, it's so exciting. And of course, they all absolutely understood intuitively the importance that this has to British heritage. I mean, it is one of our great gifts to the world, isn't it? Mm-hmm. I mean, I remember watching, um, there was a, can- a series on the canal boats with Sheila Hancock and Charles Brand was saying, but Sheila, as equal to Shakespeare is pantomime because mm-hmm. people misunderstand. They think it's easy because it's made to look so easy. And so the students are studying their art form and the techniques, what it means to break the fourth wall and the structure of pantomime and then they move on that's all reinforced then by an understanding of the industry they've all written recently a business proposal for funding uh, they're looking at the you know their so how they present the market and present themselves uh, in terms of their profiles and social on media etc and it, the course then culminates in something that we're very excited about and they are is they write direct act in perform produce design the costumes for their own pantomime, which they then take round to the local communities. So it's progressive. But I think what's been interesting for me, because we're only we're only halfway through, because uh, this go, finishes in September, we're only halfway through the delivery of this. But I've been fascinated by the way in which the whole their whole understanding of the context of the past informs and impacts upon the present. And they've all got an idea now of what they would like to do in the future and the way in which they think pantomime should tra- is evolving and transform itself. And I think they're encouraging us to be very bold and they're tapping onto the producers that are taking, uh, you know, making very, uh, for example, uh, evolution with what Duncan James did, you know, when he, when he played Jack and he was, a, he was gay. What the, they've been fascinated by what Imagine are doing with their, uh, you know, in, in some of their venues with the d- digital scenery. Uh, this is all 
opened their eyes to what's the world out there. And I suppose what I what it leaves me with for them is that I feel that they're ready to go out there and be creative and inform future practice. Well, four of the students here on this brand new MA course, which is coming to the end of its first academic year, are Jeff, Laurie, Andrew and Becky. First of all, Andrew, tell us a bit about your background and why you came to this course in the first place. First of all, I think it was a love of pantomime when I saw <laughs> that there was going to be a panto MA. But I originally, back in the early 90s, started uh, professionally in theatre as, first of all, as an actor, then quickly as a stage manager, because I could work 52 weeks of the year for that, um, and worked in subsidised repertory theatre for 20 years, until segueing into becoming a theatre photographer. And then the MA came along. And why this MA for you then? I had no plans to do an MA, but I'd always loved pantomime. And so I'd, I'd done it professionally, and it was always of interest. So to see it being put on an academic footing was, and being able to explore it was something I was really interested in. Now, Jeff, your background is very different, isn't it? It is, yes. Yeah. So I started off in musical theatre, trained as an actor, uh, was always told to be, you know, triple threat. So I wanted to get my dance skills <laughs> and my singing skills up a little bit. But it was always pantomime that I've wanted to do since, since I was a child. Like with a lot of children's first experience of theatre, it is pantomime. And that is what I've always wanted to do but just never had any, there was no gateway, there was no access to it until this MA in pantomime came along. So what's the attraction? What's the fascination with panto for you? Do you know what? It's a real love of theatre. It's drawing people back into theatres. I know over the last few years in the pandemic, theatres have struggled, but pantomime's always been that one thing of the year where it draws people in. It's a one time of the year where, you know, for some families... They can afford it. Mm. That's Christmas time, pay out from work. That's their first time of the year they can go to the theatre. And to just to bring that love and joy of a craft we're so passionate about is, is just magical. Laurie, what about you? Because you're not originally from this country. So where did Panto enter your life? So I was born in England, and um, but I moved over to Australia when I was a teenager. So Panto was my first experience of theatre. And... My mum used to book out an entire row for me and my friends <laughs> and we'd go and have the best time of the year. So after I, I went to Australia, I studied theatre and drama, a master's in film directing, teaching drama. And then my mum saw this in, in the news and I was like, that's my next thing. I have to do that because of my love of pantomime. We should say there is actually panto in Australia. Yeah. It's not as popular, I guess, as it is over here. Um, and it might be slightly different because, quite rightly, every panto, wherever it's performed, has to represent the community going to watch it. The pantos I've seen in Australia are trying them to represent... They are moving forward and representing Australia a little bit more. But for me, it misses that... Christmas element because it's boiling over there during <laughs> pantomime and you go in in your shorts and your thongs and you're like uh, missing the selection box and the snow when you come out so yeah I think those are nostalgic memories I have. Of it. I think many people who are fascinated and love panto it always goes back to their own childhood doesn't it? Yeah 100% like first memories sitting in the theatre watching a panto in Bristol and every year mum would be like right panto time and every year when we were in Australia, the one thing we missed the most was that experience of going to pantomime. So, so yeah. OK, Becky, what about you? What's your background, first of all? I think I might have detected that you may be from Liverpool. Yeah, I'm a Scouser. Hi. Yeah, <laughs> and, I, and I would say that, you know, historically, the bigger pantos have always been in the bigger cities and Liverpool has always had mm -hmm. fabulous pantos, hasn't it? Yeah, I was lucky enough to do my bachelor's degree that I've just come off of in Liverpool Hope University. So I was always in the Empire, in the Playhouse, uh, trying to see as many shows as possible. I've come off a bachelor's degree. I just love learning. I've gone straight on to my next degree. I'm a fire performer, musical theatre singer, British Sign Language singer, lyre harp player. I'm a variety performer, so I thought this was hopefully a great place for me. Um, I think it was Morgan Brin that said at the UK Pantomime Symposium in London that's just gone that Panto as a church were all the welcome and couldn't agree more. It is. You're absolutely right. And that's one of the joys of Panto for me is that it brings so many people from so many different backgrounds with so many different disciplines 
And he's keeping variety alive, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. What about you as a child? Do you remember going to see Panto for the first time? I don't know if I remember my very first one. I mean, I know that I go every single year with my family. I remember my earliest time was around 2008 seeing um, Tony from Hollyoaks. It's the first time I noticed, <laughs> oh, wait, these are, these are celebrities. I know them rather than just this is the dame, this is the comic. I know it's the same for Ed Petrie and Jack and the Beanstalk. It was uh, kind of crazy as a child recognising the stars because it's normally the parents the parents book the tickets and it's people that they recognise and you purely see them as the character. You're... Um, immersed and enveloped within that world and you just see the character. You don't see celebrity castings like you do as a a ticket booker. I have to say that, you know, Liverpool's produced so many panto legends over the years as well. John Bishop was in Mother Goose, uh, which has just finished its uh, its tour. First panto I ever saw, that I remember anyway, was Ken Dodd in Robinson Crusoe. Um, and, you know, Scylla Black, at the London Palladium, selling more tickets than than any other. So it's it's a really proud heritage in Liverpool, really, isn't it? Of course. I mean, the greats come from there. <laughs> <laughs> and you're the next. I really hope so. <laughs> <laughs> so, Andrew, tell us a bit about this course um, and what you've learned and how eye-opening it's been for somebody who's had sort of uh, quite a background in the industry. I think really coming from a, a background of having first sort of done panto in the 80s and sort of crewed it in a sort of three-line hemp house and, and you know uh, it makes me sound really old <laughs> but uh, but but coming onto the course you start seeing how pantomime is actually not a museum piece but how it's relevant for today how it should remain relevant how it should reflect the society uh, and the the heritage of, of where it is being performed and also being reflective of its community. So I think that was one of the main things for me because I came from with a love of sort of, oh, you know, Billy Dainty and seeing seeing all these and, and, and thinking, oh, wouldn't it be great to study that? But actually you sort of go, no, actually it, it's a constantly evolving form. Mm that needs to stay relevant in order to continue. And and I think understanding that has been one of the main things for me. It always has evolved and will continue to do so. The difference these days now is that, you know, a lot of the things that were passed down from generation to generation, maybe that's not happening as much. And I think the awareness of how important the industry is, the genre is, is something that the course is really important for. Absolutely. I think seeing that there is a sort of uh, a continued training to move into that, that you do, because it hasn't got that sort of route from variety that it has, you haven't got the sort of the Patton Brothers coming through unless you sort of see Dick and Dom as the sort of, you know, Patton Brothers of today. <laughs> um, I, I you realize nobody else in this room knows who the Patton Brothers are. No, probably <laughs> possibly not. Possibly not. You see, that's how old I am. The Chuckle Brothers. Maybe. The, the Chuckle Brothers brothers, yeah. we'll call them. But because it hasn't got that sort of variety route in, I think there's there's a need and there's a sort of vacuum for an understanding of the, the genre and to sort of really elevate and treasure the genre and take it seriously because I think it's been ghettoized and seen as le sort of less than theatre for a very long time. And as you've learned, I'm sure... Jeff, for companies like Imagine Theatre, because you learned about the, the financial side of, of the industry today, it's not just for Christmas. Panto is 12 months of the year. It's a full-time job and industry. And do you know what? I think a few years ago, if you had told me how much work goes into it, I would have thought, well, it's, it's a Christmas. It's a Christmas <laughs> thing, you know, it's something they do a couple of months. Having, you know, done this course and having a, that great session uh, with Sarah about all the financing, my goodness, it it really, so I underestimated just how much work goes into, you know, a short run over the festive period. There's so much work and, and that goes into this. And that is purely from from a love and passion of pantomime as an art form. I think in terms of, uh, you know, the art form itself, it's, it's really important. It's a valuable and important part of British theatre mm -hmm. as much as, if not more so, than many other things because it certainly enable some theatres to survive through that one three or four week period of the year they make enough money to keep the venue open for the rest of the year 
but also it, it's valuable in so many other ways, isn't it? Bringing youngsters to the theatre for the first time, for instance. You know, it's such an underrated part of British theatre, isn't it? Completely. I think some people see it as a show at Christmas, but actually in a lot of scripts and productions that I've I've seen, there's so many life lessons and ways to go about life for children. It's almost that we love the moral issues that are being discussed about being kind and tr- treating people how you want to be treated and, and being brave and being honest. All those themes are being explored in these stories of pantomime. It really is a, a life lesson educational tool. Absolutely. And we've mentioned it has to evolve, Laurie, but you know that means that it has to effectively change. And one of the things that you talked about recently on a symposium was the issue of diversity, getting more diverse casts and more diverse people into theatre generally, but you know, involved in Panto in particular. That's just one aspect of how this has to continue to evolve, isn't it? Yeah, 100%. Um, the UK is a very diverse country, and we should be proud of that. And as pantomime is meant to represent the UK, we sh- need to be making steps forward to that. And it's a process. And we're lucky in the pantomime that everyone knows that that process needs to happen. And we at, go into the symposium, we are actively trying to make the, that happen. And it's a great community to get involved with. And I'm really hopeful for the future of pantomime. Uh, what about the course for you? What What have you learned? What have you got out of it so far? Well, uh, that's a hard question because I think I came to the course with just the love of pantomime and I just enjoyed pantomime but going through this course I think I respect pantomime a lot more as a difficult art form we don't have long to rehearse we have lots of skills to get involved there's a whole heritage that we need to be involved in and it's not just wham bam thank you ma'am at the end of the year it's a process and I think it's underestimated a lot and hopefully it's not for much longer. In many ways that's a, that's a bad thing but in some ways it's a good thing because the audiences come in, they don't analyse it, they just go away with a smile on their faces, multi-generational groups of people all have a great time at Christmas and it's a bit like you know seeing a magic trick and then being told how it actually works. So maybe there are, there are good things about the fact that not everybody understands how it works but if you want to be in the industry it's really important isn't it? Yeah 100% if you're just going to go and watch it you need to come out with an enjoyment that I think you get every time you go to a pantomime but if you want to be part of the pantomime you need to understand the heritage and the techniques that we're we're using and we're developing and we're trying to contemporize. And, and Becky, in terms of your future, what do you hope that the MA will enable you to do in the future? How will you move on from here? Well, I always loved pantomime, but I feel like now I am in a really lucky position to understand it a lot better. Um, and that's only going to continue for other people. This is hopefully the beginning of a lot of formal education in pantomime, even within drama or within theatre or within another umbrella term. For myself moving forward, I want to carry on working in the creative sphere. I want to have a portfolio career and I want, as informed as I'm going to be at the end of this course, I want to bring that forward into the future of Panto and I want to be at a point where I'm contributing. So might that open new doors, do you think? Might you write Pantos? Maybe produce Pantos? Sarah Bowden's in the background, but even set up your own production company. Well, we are hoping to leave this MA as a fully formed pantomime or theatre company specialising in pantomime. And as the first people with this formal education, it does give us that unique selling point. It does give us agency, which we are very, very lucky to have that opportunity. And we are really looking forward to meeting more people to join us and also just to keep working together in the future. (laughs) I'm interested to know, having seen you know the the session today, which one of you is going to look after the business side of it then? Andrew. Ah, okay. <laughs> Just before we finish, I think it's interesting to sort of gauge what your favourite panto is. Do you know what my favourite pantomime is? Cinderella. And it might be because I previously just played Cinderella at the Rugeley Rose, and it was amazing. Do you remember seeing Cinderella as a child? Was it magical to see? It was always magical to see. I wanted to. 
I saw the transformation scene and I saw that and I I wanted that I wanted to be the princess on the stage and I'm now working as a as a princess <laughs> you know which is fantastic yeah um something that uh, one of my fellow actors told me before curtains came up at the beginning of every Cinderella performance was they know who you are they're your friend they already love Cinderella and that was a really really nice um p- component to it especially as um being the princess in a pantomime you don't always have the agency to directly address the audience in the way that some of the characters such as the comic and the dame mm-hmm. get to but having that level of connection with them the seeing out the sea of future princesses and princes is a very nice experience that's really lovely jo, i'd really struggle to rip up your invitation to be fair <laughs> um uh, laurie what about you what's your favorite panto not a traditional one i don't think but it's peter pan i have loved peter pan since i was a kid in the film version, the theatre version, and the panto version, and I wish I saw it more often. You see, saying traditional is interesting because lots of panto titles have been lost along the way. New ones have always come in. Mm. People don't think Peter Pan's uh, panto just because there's no traditional dame in it, but I think, you know, panto can survive without some of the elements as long as it's got other elements of traditional panto in it, and Peter Pan has. There's Mm. lots of slapstick, lots of comedy, and so on. So was that a panto you saw at a very early age? Yeah, I think so. I can't remember it specifically, um, like when I saw it, but I remember seeing it as a kid and I remember being terrified of Hook. And then I remember seeing all the magic of the flying. And I just think it has all of those components that you need. Uh, Like you say, it may not have the traditional dame, but you could put her somewhere in there. Well, I've done Peter Pan with a dame in, let me tell you. you And Sarah was talking to you today about finances. And one of the things with Peter Pan that is also a consideration with budgets is the flying because it's expensive. Think about that one as well. (laughs) Uh, Jeff, what about you? What's your favourite panto? Now, if you had asked me that a year ago, I couldn't have told you because there's so many different stories and productions Mm -hmm. I've seen, but recently Mother Goose has become my favourite. It's one of those stories which is uh, going back to what I said about pantomime being an educational tool. It's one of those stories which sort of brings kindness into audiences lives and our our course director Richard he directed and wrote a production of Mother Goose and uh, in his production his vision for it was all about treating others how he wanted to be treated being kind to people appreciating and being grateful for what you have and I think in a today's society with mental health being very important and well-being being a topic to discuss it's one of those things which i think just brings everything all together and makes pantomime a very open very nurturing art form i totally agree it's obviously um it's all about selfishness she's very narcissistic and so on and the moral is quite clear and there's always a clear moral with panto and that's that's one of the reasons why it works isn't it oh absolutely and i think that's what one of the many factors that brings audiences in every year and especially at a festive time where people are with families and for those that don't have families but still come along it's almost like an extended family well let's leave the best till last shall we because (laughs) it probably started the Patton brothers or somebody like that (laughs) or Norman Evans who knows Norman Evans now we're talking what's your favourite panto I I got to play the Baroness in Cinderella this year as part of the course which was fantastic Uh, first time I'd done a frog did you shave I went to no, I, no. I, I've got a beard, but I had, I went to a very sort of stubbly beard. Rather, I, yeah, I didn't want to sort of go sort of too sort of feminine <laughs> with it. But actually, I think Aladdin would be my ah. favourite pantomime, simply because, and it's part of having looked at it on the course. I really, it, it's a it's a problematic panto. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it, it's it's a challenge for producers these days, and it's a challenge in terms of sort of representation or where you set it or how you approach it. And I think I find that very interesting. And I think I don't think it's a pantomime that, that should be sort of said, oh, ah, we can't touch Aladdin anymore. I think we can, and I think it's it's a way that in, engenders new thinking in writers and directors and performers. So I think it's very important that it's, that it's out there because it's such a fantastic story. But yeah. it needs to be reinvented for today. In many ways, I think a lot of these uh, titles, and there are issues with some of the others as well, mm. I think if you take it back to the original story 
and you know one of the tales of the Arabian Nights uh, and you take it from there because a lot of the things that have been added in panto terms over the years are the things that are outdated mm. so you've got to think about casting and so on as well yeah. Sinbad was a very popular panto for a while and that disappeared I think Aladdin's got a future. You've got to be careful, haven't you? Yeah, it's the same with Robinson Crusoe. I mean, it was only at the end of the sort of Victorian era that Sir Richard Francis Burton put Mm -hmm. Aladdin into China. It was originally an Arabian story, as you you said. And it's a mess anyway. It doesn't make sense, does it? No, it makes no no sense at all, but that's great. I think that's the joy of it. (laughs) So in terms of the course for you, what do you hope to take from it? I think just to further my love and enjoyment of pantomime. And I think whenever I... I did it not as a sort of career progression, but whenever I've taken anything seriously, whenever ever I've entered into something, it's opened up opportunities that I didn't imagine it was going to. So I'm looking and interested to see where this leads. Well, listen, well done, everybody. You're the very first on a brand new course. I hope you're proud of that as well. I wish you all the success with the course and wherever it takes you. Thank you so much for spending some time with us. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Thank you very much. Well, after a fascinating session with Sarah Bowden, looking at the business and the finance side of pantomime, I think they learned a lot today, Sarah. Yeah, I think they did. I took them through an awful lot of detail, but we literally walked through the finance of a production as if they were producers, right the way through from working out what production we're putting on, through the scheduling, the pricing, the budgeting, the overtime calculations, <laughs> contracting, and right the way through settlements. So yeah, I'm hoping that they went away having learned a little bit, um, if, if not a lot, fingers crossed. I mean, it's a vitally important part of the business, isn't it? And business is the key word, and it's often overlooked by people who love pantomime. They just think it magically happens. Yeah, it is. It never ceases to fascinate me because it's called show business for a reason. And the show is really important, but it's underpinned by the business. And people don't realise that there is a full team of people working all the time on Panto. We have 25 staff members working all year round. Quite a few of the students today thought that we did it for a few months and then had a few months off which would be very nice, Uh, but that's not how it works. Um, And ultimately considering as well how a business like Imagine pays its overheads. Just like any other business, we have to keep the tax man happy, the VAT man happy, we have to pay our overheads, we've got bills to pay, we've got staff uh, salaries to pay, we've got to pay NI and pensions and all of those kinds of things. And, And that has to be factored in when you're planning a production. So yes, the magic is on stage, but the process underpinning it has to be robust and strong. I think they were, all of the information you gave them was eye-opening, but they were particularly staggered about the fact that a lot of the stuff you have to pay for up front, you know, and by the time you've got the settlement, six months of the year has probably gone by. That's right. It's like any business. Cash is king, cash flow. Mm. Um, I spend a lot of my time looking at cash flow and how it works. And these are the elements of pantomime that you don't always think about when you're watching Sparkle on stage and the magic at Christmas. You don't realise that there's people like myself behind the scenes having to financially plan but that's what the MA is all about and what what we've been here today to talk about and and to meet the, the team and to meet Richard and Rob and, and the students was just lovely to be able to talk to them about another different aspect of pantomime and uh, one which I could talk for hours about but which would probably <laughs> bore everybody thoroughly. I think the interesting thing is finally that you know m- many members of an audience won't have considered any of this uh, but all of the people that we've spoken to today have a background in theatre in some area and they too were staggered by this. So maybe a lot of people in the industry should open their eyes and find out more as well. Well, yeah, I've always said I would just love to do a full finance talk with the people we work with at Christmas. I can make it as easy going as we need it to. As you know, Martin, today (laughs) I tried to break it down into very simple steps of how it all works. But I think if we were all talking the same language, we would all it would be easier across the board um but hopefully that those that were in the talk today will understand more and that was the objective of today but it's been so lovely to be up here with the ma team and to get to talking to them and that's it for now it's great to meet so many students who are incredibly enthusiastic about pantomime Don't forget there are many more fabulous guests still to come. In the next episode, we'll be celebrating once again because May marks the 18th birthday of Imagine Theatre. So thanks again for downloading this episode. Please subscribe through your favourite podcast app and make sure you join me, Martin Ballard, next time for some birthday cake and episode 52. Thank you for listening to the latest edition of Just Imagine, the podcast series from Imagine Theatre. 
and you can find out more by going to www.imaginetheatre.co.uk.